Morning, everyone. Good morning. Okay, we still have a few folks joining us from the waiting room, so we'll just give them. All right. All right, everyone's here. Good morning. May 26th. <laughs> Things are looking a lot different today than they were last May 26th. So uh, anyway, good morning, everyone. I'm Gil Price. I'm the executive director here at Condominium Law Group. Always great to see you all. Uh, this is clearly something we all look forward to every uh, Wednesday. Zoom toolbar, you'll find that on the bottom of your screen. You've got that mute icon. We've got everyone muted for the moment. Uh, if you do want to ask a question, you can use, uh, use your voice, unmute yourself, or use the chat feature. The chat feature is something I'll talk about in a minute. Valerie just put a message out in chat this morning, so you can um, uh, make sure that is working. Stop video if you'd like for us to see you. Click uh, on or off that uh, icon. Uh, chat feature is kind of in the middle of your screen on the bottom of that uh, Zoom toolbar. So. Um, Click on that, that'll open up a window on your right-hand side. We've got a lot of really great questions. Once again, uh, I, know, I know we've been chatting about this. We're not here to provide legal advice, folks. This is just a general Q&A. Anytime a question gets really detailed and you're sending us snippets of your governing documents and citing RCWs, you're gonna to wanna to reach out to your own uh, general counsel um, or collections counsel, uh, whoever uh, that uh, attorney may be. All right, I'm gonna stop chatting. Valerie's gonna lead us off this morning. Thanks everyone. Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for being here today as, as always. Uh, we're gonna start with an update on the status of COVID and the proclamation as we do each week. And there's not a really substantial update for anything at this point. There's been no change to the proclamation. And for any of you who might be new this week, the proclamation I'm talking about is Proclamation 20-51 which was, went into effect last year on April 17th of 2020. And that proclamation uh, prohibits associations from charging late fees and interest on unpaid assessments. It also authorizes community associations to conduct meetings remotely, as well as vote by mail. So a lot of communities did not have that authority previous to the proclamation because of limitations in their governing documents but everybody has that ability right now. And in theory, at least, the proclamation is set to continue and provide authority for remote meetings and voting by mail until Senate Bill 5011 takes effect at the end of July, July 26th, I think, is when um, that will become uh, effective legislation. And that bill will authorize community associations to continue with remote meetings and voting by mail. It also will allow associations to send notices to your owners electronically on an opt-in basis. So that just means you have to get your owners to opt-in or ask for electronic notice. If they don't want to opt-in, you can't force them to accept electronic notice. And that again is under Senate Bill 5011, which will take effect at the end of July. So, I wanted to go a little bit further uh, into detail about some of the changes that we talked about last week because there were a lot of questions about whether the mask mandate ending, how that will affect community associations and also the governor's indication that the economy in Washington will be fully reopened by June 30th. We had some folks who were worried that that meant the state of emergency would be over and therefore the proclamation might expire and that we'd have a gap between the proclamation and the new legislation that authorizes the things I just talked about. So there's no indication right now from reading anything that the governor has released about this reopening of the economy or the update to the mask mandates that indicates the state of emergency is gonna be lifted at the end of June when the economy is fully reopened. So I think that it should lay to rest some of people's fears that there might be a, a so an early end to the proclamation and you know leave us with a gap where we can't do things like remote meetings, uh, which is the way a lot of us are doing things these days as we've adapted to this COVID situation. So, so I don't think we need to worry about that. I will offer also that there has been some talk this week indicating that it might be possible the governor lifts the 
or reopens the economy earlier than June 30th. So we'll keep watching and if we hear anything more definitive on that, we'll definitely let you all know. The other thing that we wanted to remind everybody is a couple of things. So we hear a lot of people saying things, well, now that the CDC has lifted the mask requirement, you know, X, Y, Z, fill in the blank. This is my question. So first of all, the CDC's recommendation, which is what Washington state has chosen to follow is only that people who are fully vaccinated can choose not to wear masks when they're in public with a actually fairly robust list of exceptions, including things like public transportation and healthcare settings, things like that. So a couple of things. That, that's not a lifting of the mask mandate across the board. It only pertains to people who are fully vaccinated. And for example, King County has specifically stated that the mask mandate remains in place in public places and, and businesses and such within, within King County. So I think everybody's ready to be done wearing masks. I mean, I will put my hand up and say that I'm among those that will be very excited when it's safe enough for us to all just kind of throw our masks to the wind and not have to wear them anymore. But I think we should proceed with caution and keep in mind that the mask mandate has not been lifted, which is the way a lot of people are referring to it. It's just been modified slightly. And that modification is not across the board because local companies, sorry, individual companies and also local um, you know, municipalities or counties such as King County can continue to keep mask mandates in place regardless of the CDC's guideline or guidance. So um, another thing that I wanted to give everybody a uh, this information on is that if you look at the proclamation that provides the update to the Healthy Washington Roadmap to Recovery, and I'm looking back and forth to my computer right now because I'm actually going to link, provide you all with a link to that proclamation. Uh, it specifically also authorizes uh, or says that employers can, can continue to require that employees wear masks in the workplace regardless of vaccination status. And it also says that employers can require employees to become vaccinated as a condition of employment. And employers can require employees to provide proof of their vaccination status. So for example, if people say, well, sure, I'm vaccinated, I don't wanna wear a mask anymore. As an employer, you have the right to ask your employee for proof of their vaccination status. This is different than community associations with their members, okay? So there's no, I'm not making an, an analogy here or suggesting that a, an HOA or a condo association can require members to provide you proof of vaccination. But if you have uh, association employees, and also we know there are lots of managers on this call, and so this might be applicable within your management companies, that information is contained in the proclamation. Ken, did you wanna add anything else before I keep moving? No, we're good. Okay. All right. So the next topic that I want to cover is a question that came in about reopening clubhouses. And the question is, I would like your thoughts on opening clubhouses. I would assume masks and social distancing would be necessary, but under those guidelines, do you think it's okay to open a clubhouse now? So one of the things that we were chatting about when we were talking about this question beforehand is that uh, we're finding a lot of um, boards want a very definitive black and white sort of yes or no answer to these questions. In other words, they want to be all the way open like COVID never happened or they want to keep everything shut down. And, and anything in between those two things is a little bit more difficult to manage and some boards are just not interested in that. So if that is where your community is coming from, looking for a very easy, clean, like it's all like COVID never happened or we stay closed, our recommendation is that you stay closed for now, if those are the only two options in your, in, your, in your mind. But we think that there is a reasonable third option, which is that if you uh, look up the capacity limits uh, in the Healthy Roadmap Recovery Plan for the phase that we're in, and I think all of our counties are in phase three right now, and I'm pretty sure that capacity is 50%, then you could reopen your clubhouse as long as you don't allow more than 50% of the of capacity within the building and that you require owners to wear masks and maintain social distancing. So if you have, have the, the means to, to mandate that, to look up your capacity guidelines, 
limit the number of people that are in your clubhouse at any given time, make it clear to the owners that masks and social distancing are still required. Um, we think that it would be reasonable for your association to reopen the clubhouse. If you look, if you need specific advice for your, you know, specific circumstances or situation, then obviously you need to reach out to your association attorney before you make those decisions. Because as Gil said, we can't give legal advice here. We can just give general information and guidelines. So, so no one's going to be able to, no one's going to be able to tell you that there is no risk to opening your clubhouse. Okay. And that's part of what I keep getting uh, questions about is they, they want me to somehow assure them that there's no risk to the association of opening a clubhouse. Not possible to be in a no risk world. That was true before COVID. You know, it's not possible to open up a swimming pool without there being some risk of a person drowning. Okay. So all you can do is manage it as best you can. And the, you know, the, it's a balancing that the board has to do between what the risk is and what the benefit is to their community members from having the clubhouse or swimming pool or fitness center or whatever it is that you're trying to reopen. And we're certainly close to it being hard to argue that everything should be closed. If we get into mid-July and the governor has reopened the state and King County has reopened King County, it's going to be hard for you to argue that you should keep everything closed in your community, but it would still be, be within the board's legal rights to keep everything closed in the county if they felt the risk was unacceptable or they felt that their membership was not being reasonable in how they use the facilities. And we'll talk a little bit more later on. Ken is going to cover the board's duty of care and how it makes these decisions. Because one of the things that we said last week was there's not a black and white right or wrong answer that is one size fits all for every community. The, the most important thing as your board makes these decisions is that it does so bearing in mind its duty of care and sort of gathering information from your team of experts is you know the way the terminology that I end up using. Um, but there is a case called Risk v. Angel that talks specifically about how boards make decisions and when they do and don't meet their, their duty of care in making those decisions. Ken will go into that a little bit later today so that you guys have some um, guideposts for, for how to know if you as a board or if, you know, if I'm talking to the managers on the call, if the boards that you work with are doing what they need to do in order to make these decisions defend, defensible in the long run. So. And then speaking also of pools reopening, Ken briefly mentioned that. I'm gonna pop a link into the chat right now. Um, it was a really long link. So I just used a tiny URL thing to shorten the link. Please tell me if it doesn't work, but it's a link to a booklet that they published just this past week. It should be available to anybody, even if you're not a member of CAI and it's about reopening uh, pools in your community associations. So anything else, Ken, before I keep moving? Uh, I will offer CAI also has a something that they're calling a status check, which is at their uh, online publishing as well. It's free to CAI members, which but you have to be a member of the national organization in order to get it for free. Uh, it does look a lot like rehashing some of the old information from last summer. Um, but it is uh, more detailed for different kinds of community association facilities, you know, fitness centers, uh, clubhouses, pools. If, if you're interested in something like that, that's what the national guidance is. But, I, you know, I would look at it probably as if we're only four or five weeks away from the governor and the county opening things back up, I don't know how necessary that would be. But also keep in mind, it doesn't mean that you don't or that you shouldn't still have some reasonable precautions about distancing or cleaning and sanitizing or scheduling use of facilities that are, uh, you know, very densely populated. That those kinds of changes you still need to think about as you go forward. Go ahead, Gil. So, uh, thank you. Um, I had a question come in directly to me, and it has to do with commercial condominiums and whether or not uh, this is this commercial condominium happens to be a storage facility. 
<clears throat> that's registered as a condominium and has one residential unit. They're wanting to know, can, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> can you charge late fees? <coughs> Does it apply to all condominiums or are commercial condominiums accepted from that? There's no exception. The proclamation modifies all of the statutes that otherwise confer authority to associations to charge late fees and interest. And it just takes those portions right out. So there is no condominium or homeowners association in Washington state right now, regardless of whether it's residential, commercial, or mixed use that has the authority to charge late fees or interest on unpaid assessments. All right, I'm gonna keep moving through the topics that we wanted to cover today. So we wanted to let everybody know that recording fees are going up $100 a piece at the end of July, July 25th of this year. So what this means is that if you have a lien to be recorded, uh, it used to be, or currently, the recording fees are $103.50 for the first page of any document and then a dollar for each page thereafter. And starting on July 26, that recording fee for the first page is going to go up $100. So it'll be $203.50 or something close to that amount. Sometimes they also adjust it a little bit for inflation. So we don't know yet if that's going to happen. So that, that's going to start on July 25th. So for any, anybody that has associations that has kind of been sitting on things and maybe has some liens to record, but has been waiting for the proclamation to expire or the pandemic to end, or whatever the case might be, uh, the cost of liens and therefore the release that you will ultimately also have to record when the lien is paid off, the recording fee is going up. It's almost going to double, right? Because it's 103.50 right now. It's going to go up by $100. So if you have things that you're thinking about recording, uh, you might want to try to get those things accomplished before J July 25th when those fees go up. We also are going to want people just to be thinking in general about the cost, for example, of sending an account to your attorney for collections. Um, we have always recommended that associations be proactive with delinquencies because the smaller a delinquency is and the, the newer it is when it gets sent to us, generally the easier and the cheaper and the faster it is for us to help the owner bring the account current. At the same time, the cost of sending a demand letter and recording a lien, and then of course you have to also, like I just said, think about the lien release cost, is going to jump by $200 now between the you know, $100 increase for the lien and then for the later release. So one thing that some communities will be thinking about and that we'll be talking with certainly with our clients about is whether it makes sense to consider sending a demand letter without a lien to begin with waiting that 30 days and then only recording the lien if the owner doesn't respond or pay the balance that's due. So these are all things to keep in mind. And these recording fees affect uh, all documents that are recorded across the board. So also if you've got communities that are working on passing amendments uh, and the process just isn't going as quickly as you might like it to go, this maybe creates a little bit of financial incentive to move that along a little bit um, because it will increase the cost of recording any amendments by $100 as well. And so related to the cost of, and just the topic of liens, one of the other things that we wanted to remind everybody about is that although condominiums in Washington state and Wakiowa communities across the board have a resale certificate requirement for a property to be sold, HOAs that were formed before Wakiowa was enacted in 2018 do not have a resale certificate requirement. And so HOAs that, you know, pre-2018 HOAs are communities that do carry or bear a risk that properties within those communities can be sold without the amount that's due, if there is one, being paid to the association, especially if there's no lien recorded. So in other words, recording a lien for an HOA is sometimes the only way to make sure that a balance due by a current owner is paid when they sell their property. Because if there's no resale certificate, and if you're not working with a, an escrow company that, for whatever reason, if they miss that the community, that the property that's being sold is part of an HOA, and if they don't reach out to the HOA <clears throat> for a payoff amount, the lien being recorded in the public record may be your only protection from the property being sold without payment of the lien. So, <clears throat> so for HOAs in particular, uh, and for all of our communities, but HOAs in particular, 
being proactive about recording liens can help you reduce your risk of things like that happening. Um, and if, it, if you do end up in a situation where a property within your HOA is sold without satisfaction of the balance that's due to the association, uh, consult with your association attorney because, you know, depending on what your documents say, you may have recourse, you definitely would still have recourse in most situations against the prior owner for that balance due, but it's possible that the, the buyer also would then inherit liability, or if not inherit liability, that the lien would survive the sale. So, Ken, did you want to uh, talk anything else about that? I actually want to back up a little bit. For people okay. who are interested, the statute which takes effect increasing the recording fees is House Bill 1277. And this is basically a tax on all real estate and other recording kinds of transactions to raise $136 million. I believe the purpose is rental assistance for uh, people who might be evicted. But you can read in the bill, it basically is taxing the, I'll say the real estate industry uh, to serve a social purpose, which is explained in the bill. Thanks, Ken. Okay, I'm gonna keep moving. The next question that we wanna cover came in from one of our association managers. Um, and the question is this, at one of our associations, we have a tenant, not the homeowner, who has an upside down American flag, which is a distress signal. The board of directors wants the association, the association manager to write the tenant a letter asking him to remove the flag. Is the upside down American flag protected speech under the first amendment? And or is there a statute that prohibits people from using this distress signal when they're not actually in distress? I'm paraphrasing here. Uh, the manager shared that they don't feel comfortable writing a letter to the tenant without legal advice. So again, I'm just going to use that as an opportunity to say this is not legal advice. I don't know what your particular documents say. This is this is not a forum in which we can give specific legal advice uh, in particular because we don't even know if the people who are asking this are the association that this is about is one of our clients. So what I can say is this. Um, I don't know there certainly is not a statute that we are aware of that prohibits people from using a distress signal when they're not in distress. And although flipping your flag upside down might be known to be a distress signal, I think the fact that it's being flown in a community association and that it's always being flown that way makes it pretty clear to anybody who is, you know, familiar with the community that that, that person who's flying the flag upside down probably isn't in distress. Um, and there may be a reason that he's flying, he or she is flying the flag upside down like that. It might be an oversight or a mistake on their part. And I am not sure that I want to be the attorney in court arguing that the association has the right to require someone to remove their American flag, regardless of whether it's being displayed properly. And more to the point, most of our clients don't want to be sort of like the test case with scenarios like this, right? So there's no case that I'm aware of that interprets this particular set of facts. Um, and if you want there to be a case, you could certainly volunteer to be the, the test case. But being the test case is a pretty expensive process that most of our clients don't want to participate in. So my suggestion in a scenario like this would be, you can certainly ask the tenant to either display the flag properly or, or take it down if they don't want to do that. Um, I'm not sure that that I want to be um, part of requiring that flag to be flipped over or removed. And I'm not sure that an association, I think it's not a, a proposition that's without risk. One of the things that Ken and I were chatting about when we were discussing this question ahead of time is that um, Ken has in, in our office sort of created this, this sort of matrix or, you know, like flow chart, I guess, of the ways that you communicate with owners when you're trying to get them to do a certain thing. And it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, a flow chart that starts with, um, you know, suggesting things to people and then moves to per trying to persuade them. And only once those two options fail, do you then move to de making demands or uh, issuing ultimatums to your owners. Um, we think that whenever possible, associations should be in those first two, you know, um, those first two parts of the matrix, I guess, su suggesting and persuading. So you can always ask your neighbors to do something 
uh, without threatening or using the association's enforcement powers to try to make them do it. And in this particular situation, because flying the American flag is protected speech, just because it's upside down, I don't, I don't know that that makes the, the protection go away. And I don't want to be the one to find out. I don't want my client to be the one to find out, I think is more to the point. So, um, Ken, did you have anything else you wanted to add on that? No, I'm good. Okay. Um, so the next question is, um, okay, so this is the question. What is the violation called for HOAs to not be able to ask for vaccination card proof if it's not a violation of HIPAA. In board meetings the last few weeks, homeowners are saying that they are reading in the news that it's not technically a HIPAA violation for an HOA to ask for proof of vaccination because HOAs are not medical facilities. So I think there's two issues here. One, one is this. I think basically the question is why can't HOAs ask owners for proof of vaccination, right? Because this is something that we have said repeatedly throughout uh, the, the time frame that we've been talking about the vaccine, that we don't think associations should ask homeowners to provide proof of vaccination. We think that doing so carries with it a high level of risk and there is little benefit. Government, the government has told local businesses that they should not be requiring their patrons to provide proof of vaccination. And we think that guidance given to local businesses is certainly reasonable for associations to rely on as guidance for community associations. Um, but there is no, I think part of the question is what's the law that says an HOA can't ask somebody to prove they're vaccinated? And I think there is no law because COVID is so new, right? I don't know how, how familiar folks are with the legislative process, but um, can do you can you give me a ballpark of how long Wakaiowa was in the works, meaning how how many years it took to get it written and then presented to the legislature before it was finally adopted in its ultimate form? Well, Wakaiowa was ten years. Okay. <laughs> but if you look at something like even the most recent modifications to how associations run meetings, that was right. as fast tracked as a piece of legislation could be, and it still took a year for right. it to become uh, adopted by the legislature and it's yet to become law. Right, so the, the, that is just to illustrate the fact that laws don't happen overnight, they take time. We've only had public um, access to the COVID vaccine for a handful of months at this point, certainly not long enough for the legislature to realize, hey, maybe we should enact a law that says who can and can't ask for vaccination proof. And so the best that we can do is look at all of the other guidance that there is out there about things like this, in particular guidance given to other businesses, even though associations are not, you know, businesses like with a storefront, for example, and, and suggest that, again, we don't think our clients want to be the test case for this scenario. So what would end up happening if your association demanded vaccine or proof of vaccination from home homeowners or what could end up happening is that a homeowner might refuse to provide that proof and then if you're saying well you can't use the whatever pool clubhouse whatever amenity is that you're requiring people to show proof of vaccination for you've you've uh, disallowed an owner from access to a common element that they are supposed to have access to by virtue of their ownership within the community and if they decide to sue the association, the end result of all of that litigation, if it's not settled, would be some case that says whether or not it's okay for the association to ask for vaccination status. Um, lawsuits are expensive and they take a really long time. So even if you win, you might not really felt like you won much of anything after a scenario like that. So, so we think that it's a high risk thing to do um, we, I do want to clarify, though, that it is true that HIPAA does not apply to community associations. HIPAA is a privacy law or a set of privacy laws that applies to healthcare providers and to other businesses who have possession of people's individual healthcare records. And it governs how they can, you know, share or disseminate that information. So asking somebody for their vaccination status does not put you under the purview of HIPAA. But that does not mean that it's a good idea to require or ask for proof of vaccination. So I hope that answers the question. Um, but if anybody wants to ask for clarification, feel free to do so in the chat. And I'm going to keep moving to the next question, 
which is this. How should a community form an anti-harassment policy and how does it attach to the governing documents? So I'm gonna answer the second part of the question first, which is essentially that you would treat an anti-harassment policy more or less the same as you would treat uh, the rules and regulations for your community. So an anti-harassment policy could be adopted by the board and then sent out to the owners and then enforceable as a set of, as a sort of an extension of your association's rules. The exception to that is that under Wakaiowa, communities that are governed by Wakaiowa do have an obligation to send notice to your owners before you adopt rules and then provide owners with a meaningful opportunity to comment before those rules are adopted by the board. Um, so there's a couple of different options that we have to suggest for community associations that are interested in anti-harassment policy. CAI National has a civility policy that is available on their website. That would be a good starting point for communities to look at. There's also a ton of examples of anti-harassment policies available online. If you just Google, you know, condo association anti-harassment policy or homeowners association anti-harassment policy or just anti-harassment policies in general, you can find a lot of different examples of anti-harassment policies out there and perhaps try to customize one for your community. We also have a, a communications and anti-harassment policy that we draft for our clients uh, relatively routinely. And so if you're interested, if this question is coming from a community that's one of our clients or that wants to become one of our clients, I guess, in order to have us draft a policy like this for you, we can do that as well. So, so I think the, you know, the, how you do it is that the board uh, votes to adopt a policy, whether it's provided by your attorney or drafted after you kind of look at a bunch of examples out there is a separate question. And um, it's treated more or less like your rules and regulations are an extension of them. So did you want to um, add anything else to that, Ken? No, I'm good. Okay. All right, next question. We are wondering what the latest is for face-to-face -face HOA meetings. Now that masks are okay to come off as per CDC guidelines, what is the correct legal protocol for this? We are tired of Zoom, but we want to follow correct and safe procedures. So um, I just wanna kind of harken back to my comments from earlier, which is that, uh, and I'm, I, it may be that the person who asked this question did not mean it this way, but the way this question reads suggests that the person might think the mask, masking guidelines are out the window, that we don't have to wear masks anymore. And that isn't the case. The CDC guidelines, again, only say that, un, that vaccinated, fully vaccinated individuals can choose not to wear masks in public places. And so if you are, for example, thinking about trying to host an HOA meeting similarly to how you would have done it before COVID ever happened, you know, in a library meeting room or in your clubhouse or whatever, and you don't want to be enforcing masks and social distancing and whatnot, I, I don't think we're there yet. Because people who have not been vaccinated, and this includes everybody under the age of 12, because they can't even get vaccinated at this point. So if kids, you know, people are bringing their kids or whatever, um, people who are not vaccinated are still supposed to wear masks. And again, you don't want to be putting yourself in the position of trying to be the vaccination police or the mask police there are also still restrictions in place for how many people can gather in a given space at one time. Um, again, this uh, relates to the capacity limitations and I think 50% capacity is the current restriction. I might be wrong on that. I'll look it up and put it in the chat if I'm wrong after I'm done talking. So I think that um, the other thing I'll offer is that we are only a few weeks away, four or five weeks away from the governor fully reopening the state and the restrictions that are in place right now will largely go away or be um, loosened even more. So maybe, maybe my answer to this question would be different in six weeks once we've had a week to become familiar with the updates to our situation after the end of June, end of June comes and goes. But I think right now, if you're looking at doing an in-person HOA meeting, the guidelines that I would suggest you keep in mind would be that it should still be fully masked if it's going to be indoors, meaning you require everybody to wear masks so you're not messing with the question of who's vaccinated and who's not vaccinated. It should be in a space that allows you to maintain social distancing given the number of people that you think will attend. 
Um, and also given the time of year and the fact that the weather is, I don't know, halfway decent, at least some of the time, maybe you look at an outdoor space, if there's a covered space outdoors uh, within your community or close to your community um, that you could rent or take advantage of, that might be a decent option as well. And then stay tuned because in five or six weeks, once the governor does reopen the state fully and we see what restrictions remain or if they all go away, then, then the answer to this question might change a little bit. So, Ken, did you wanna offer anything else on that? Um, sure, we've also had questions about whether or not the governor eliminating the restrictions on you know, use of spaces is the same as the emergency order which has been put in place both at the national level and at the state level ending. So in other words, there's gonna be one day where the government comes out and says the pandemic is over. That is not the same as the day which the governor lifts the restrictions on gatherings. And so uh, to a large extent, we have no idea when that next date uh, is gonna come to, to end the pandemic or declare the emergency over. We expect it's gonna be not until at least the end of summer because people are gonna keep treating the uh, emergency or the pandemic as having effects which are economic or social, even if the virus spread has actually been uh, reduced. And so the proclamation 2051 may not actually be terminated until the end of summer. It's not going to coincide with the June 30th projected date for lifting restrictions on outdoor gatherings. And the national government may do the emergency ending at a different time than the state government does the emergency ending. And the governor may decide some way to change the date that you can start charging late fees and interest from when the pandemic is declared concluded because the economic effects may be something that they wanna take into consideration for a longer period of time. So there, you know, saying that the emergency is over is probably many months away. And what it looks like until then is still gonna be in flux and gonna be changing from basically week to week. Yeah, and then, you know, this kind of goes back to the comment we made before about there's no law about saying who can and can't ask for proof of vaccination because the situation is so new. This is a whole new thing, both the experience of a pandemic, but also how we come out of a pandemic is something that we've never done before. And so we are we are learning with you as we go and, and hopefully this can continue to be a good resource for everybody as we navigate kind of tiptoeing back towards whatever life is gonna look like, whatever normal is gonna look like um, after this pandemic is over, so. Yeah, we also uh, will be able to learn some from the experiences on the East Coast because the East Coast has been putting in place some different methods of trying to figure out who has been vaccinated and who has not and trying to, you know, allow people into restaurants that have been vaccinated, but keep out the ones who've not been vaccinated. And there have been substantial uh, sort of political and legal challenges to those procedures. And so it, it may be that in a couple of months, uh, New York and New Jersey have figured out how to make that work. And then it might be reasonable to find a way for people in Washington state to verify vaccination status. I don't think we're gonna get there personally, but it, it is interesting watching these other experiments across the country to see how they work. Yeah. All right, I have one other, oh, go ahead, Gil. Sure. There's a question, Valerie, that came in. Is there a privacy issue with having a board working session outdoors? Well, I think it depends on what your working session is about. So if you're in the middle of litigation or you're in the middle of a confidential bidding process or something else that's sensitive of that nature, and you're meeting outdoors where homeowners can overhear you, for example, um, then I think maybe that's not the best idea. Um, if it's just a working session to talk about, you know, the landscaping project that's, that you've got going on or generally how things are going in your community, probably this is less of a concern. I don't think there's a legal answer to that question. There's no statute or rule that says you should or shouldn't have working sessions or meetings outdoors. 
Um, I will remind folks, though, that working sessions, as well as executive sessions, are not intended to be a, a regular board meeting during which you make decisions as a board and um, determine how to act on behalf of the association. Those types of decisions uh, should be made in your normal board meetings and memorialized in your minutes. So Ken, did you have anything you wanted to add? Well, I would add that homeowner associations, meaning under the HOA Act and Ukiowa communities are required to have open meetings. So if you're holding a working meeting of the board to try and prevent owners from you know, listening in, then you don't understand what open meetings are and you should perhaps consult with your attorney. And so the idea that you're holding your working session outside if you're in a community that is required to have open meetings anyway, there, there cannot be a privacy concern because the owners are entitled to be there and listen in. Yes, we and, and I think to following along on that, uh, we have found that a lot of our clients um, uh, have different understanding than we do as to what a working session might be. So. Uh, if it's if you're if you're using it to avoid talking about certain things in your open board meeting, that that's not a proper use of of a, a working meeting. If it's just a few board members kind of chatting about the general direction of the association or how things are going or batting around ideas for your annual meeting or whatever, that's a little bit different. But we are very big fans of and have always encouraged our clients to be as transparent with your ownership as possible, and part of that includes. Um, I don't know, not hiding, <laughs> not to put too fine a, po a point on it, but not hiding certain things from your ownership by, by talking about them outside of your open board meetings. Um, there is another question in the chat, but I think I'm going to save that one about the business use um, for Ken at the end. So I'm going to go on to my next question, and it's the last one, and it should be relatively short, famous last words, but uh, this question is, can you please remind me what supports charging late fees and interest for HOAs? Is that 20-51? I can't find any information helpful online. Okay, so I'm not really sure whether the question is, what is an HOA's authority to charge late fees or interest? Or what is the proclamation that says you can't charge late fees and interest right now? So I'm going to answer both questions. The statute that authorizes HOAs to assess late fees and interest on unpaid assessments is RCW 64.38.020 and so it's subsection 11. However, proclamation 20-51 basically like erases that section of the HOA Act until the proclamation expires. So that's normally the statute that allows HOAs to charge late fees and interest, but that portion of the statute has been suspended by the proclamation, and it is Proclamation 20-51. So it's RCW 64-38-020-11, sub 11, and then it's Proclamation 20-51 that says you cannot currently charge late fees and interest. And if I didn't answer your question correctly, feel free to clarify it in the chat. Um, I'm gonna, I have a couple questions for you from the chat, Ken, since it's your, it's your turn next. So uh, one is, um, <clears throat> does using a condo address as a business address for a remote business, which has no office space and no hosting of clients qualify as running a business from the unit? So oh, I'm gonna suggest that that would depend on what the specific declaration for the condominium says and whether or not it has definitions of a business. Um, if the question is just generally is, can a business use a condo address as its uh, mailing address? I'm sure there are many, many businesses, especially small professional corporations, CPAs, engineers, et cetera, who are operating businesses out of their condo and it would certainly be appropriate for them to use their condo address as their mailing and official address. Uh, that may be different than a uh, somebody who's selling a lot of stuff on eBay and receiving a lot of mail or packages at the condo address. So I'll suggest you need to talk to whoever your attorney is to examine the documents for 
the uh, particular association and the facts and circumstances of how much mail is coming in would probably be relevant. Okay, next question. The board has decided to limit the election to five members instead of nine members. Governing documents do not state whether they can or can't do that. Is this something uh, that a board has the authority to decide? Okay, well, again, uh, it sounds like you'd need specific legal advice for your community to read your articles of incorporation, declaration, and bylaws. But I would say generally, boards do not get to decide how large the board is. Boards do not get to elect individual board members except to fill vacancies in between normal elections. And so if you were looking to change the size of the board of directors, I would typically say that should be the first order of business before an election at your annual meeting when you are doing an election. And we actually do have a number of clients that have variable size boards. You know, the bylaws might say that the board is no less than three or no more than seven. And the question always, well, how do we decide how many board members it is? And the answer is the community decides how many board members before they fill the board seats. So if you have a board of seven and the first order of business is to reduce the board to five, and that is a motion which passes at the annual meeting, you've reduced the board to five. If that means there are no vacancies to fill, you don't have an election. Uh, but you do have to keep in mind, you cannot reduce the size of the board in order to throw out an incumbent who is continuing to serve in a, a position which is not expiring. So if you've got a three-year term and a person is two years into the term, you can't reduce the board down to three and use that as an excuse to throw out that person. You would continue to have all positions to the end of their term, even if it meant having more board members than your new, new decision. But I think that's it. So. Should I move on to the couple of questions I've got? Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, we've got a couple of questions, which uh, one we moved from last week, which is about uh, having a standing agenda. So if you are a Ukiowa community or an HOA and you have published a schedule of all of your meetings for the year, how do you have an agenda which adequately informs the membership about what the board will discuss at any particular meeting. Um, and especially if you're not sending out another notice 14 days in advance of each board meeting. And I think that uh, the, the answer is gonna relate to reasonableness. And it's also going to relate to how much risk you wanna tolerate as a community. Uh, certainly if you want to have the lowest possible risk, you would send out an official agenda 14 days in advance of every meeting with minute detail about everything you know about that's going to occur. I think that that's probably not the legislature's intent, but unless there's a court to interpret the legislature's intent, there's not a way for us to know for sure. I think that it is reasonable to have a standing agenda that might include review of the financials as a standing item, instead of having to list every invoice that's going to be reviewed at the meeting. I think it's reasonable to have as a standing item review of ACC requests, which have been received prior to the uh, agenda notice or prior to the meeting. So that uh, owners would know that all of the ACC requests are gonna be discussed, even though you don't know exactly which ACC request or which owner has made a request is going to be on the agenda. I think it's reasonable to say that uh, collections will be discussed without knowing exactly which units are delinquent and how you're going to handle them. I think it would be reasonable to say that enforcement actions or violations will be discussed on the agenda without knowing precisely which violations those are. I think that the, the question is sort of philosophically, what was the legislature's intent? Was it the intent that owners have an opportunity to be informed if they want to be, or was it an obligation of the board to push out information on everything that the board is going to do 
to every owner and make them aware. And I think that the, the, the way that the statutes have been crafted is that an owner who wants to be informed can be informed, that the board cannot hide things from the membership. But the, the board is not obligated to make sure every owner knows what's going on and the issues that are going to be discussed. It requires that the individual owners take some effort and responsibility for finding out what's going on. There are a few exceptions to that and they are stated in the, the statutes. So for example, under Ukiowa, if the board wants to change the rules, it is required to send the proposed rules out to the membership at least 30 days in advance of when the board makes a final decision. And I think that uh, because they have made that that exception requiring an affirmative action by the board, that that does help me believe that the legislature did not Im imply or expect every other decision made by the board to be put in advance in an agenda, uh, specifically mailed out or posted on an e-board to everyone in the community before the board can conduct its normal course of business. So if these are, you know, kind of typical and usual issues that come before the board for collections, violations, contract approvals, et cetera. If they are small routine things, I think that it is the owner's obligation to come to the meetings and be informed. If it is something significant, a rule change, a major contract or special assessment, those require that they be addressed by um, special notice and even meetings of the members in order for the board to take action. But there's not gonna be an absolute black and white answer for how all these meetings are to be conducted until you get a, a lawsuit and a court of appeals decision. Uh, the second question was related to, you know, if you've given notice of when the meeting is going to occur and then you start changing the place of the meeting or the time of the meeting, how much additional notice or how would you give additional notice? And I think, you know, the same answer applies. If you want strict compliance to have the minimum risk, you would give 14 days notice under Ukiowa because that's what the statute says. If you are moving the meeting from one room in a building to another room in a building, I think you could probably post a notice on the door at the first location telling them where to go and you'd be okay. If you're talking about uh, online forums, Zoom or go to meetings, and you're changing it, then I think that, you know, it, it starts to get back what's reasonable. If you gave a week's notice to people, I think that's probably reasonable. If they went to the site that you had posted originally and they got an electronic message back saying the location has changed, use this new URL, I think that would probably be okay. The question really becomes of, you know, just how much of a barrier has been created on a person getting to the meeting. And, you know, part of the question was, well, what if we change the day of the meeting, how to get connected to it online? And I think probably the day of the meeting is not reasonable because a lot of people are not gonna be checking their emails or looking at electronic notice boards you know, 10 or 15 minutes before the meeting. So that may not be reasonable. On the other hand, if you send it a couple days in advance, it's probably reasonable. And I think if you were to, you know, if you change a meeting from six o'clock to seven o'clock and everyone shows up at, at six o'clock and is disappointed they have to wait an hour, that is a safer thing to do than moving the meeting from six o'clock to five o'clock when all of the business has been conducted before the people have shown up for the meeting they expected to have. So try and be reasonable in what you're doing. You're probably okay, but if you want the lowest possible risk or you're dealing with an issue that you believe is controversial, then do strict compliance with the way the statute's written. Ken, yes. I, a suggestion that I have just related to something I, was, I participated in earlier this week as I attended the executive session for with a board uh, that wanted to talk about some legal stuff. And then they wanted to make a decision about what we discussed. And so I said, hey, look, you have to go back into open session. 
And they said, well, we already dismissed everybody because they have executive session before, I'm sorry, after their board meeting instead of before. And they were really worried. And I think it was great actually that they were concerned about wanting to make sure that they kept their note, their ownership notified and that they weren't, you know, like trying to hide something by doing this, you know, weird return to open session after the owners had all left. And so my suggestion to them was start the next meeting by informing the owners who attend that after last week's executive session, we briefly, you know, came back into open session and this is the, the decision that we made so that it's really clear to your owners that you're making an effort to keep them informed because that's the whole purpose or spirit behind these rules and, and statutes is to make sure that your owners are informed and can, can be informed about what's going on within your community. So I, I think, think when I think that works. And if your meeting minutes also reflected that the board came back after executive session and took this action, that's fine. And going forward, if people are concerned, then you would find a mechanism by which you could let people back in. So, I mean, in theory, if you were doing it on Zoom, people could have all been in the waiting room waiting for the board to come out of the executive session and be they would be allowed back into the room. They just wouldn't know how long it was going to take. They'd have to sit by their computer waiting. The other the thing is you could do executive. In a, the same as well, if they were put outside to wait while a, a board conducted a executive session in a room. And you could also just have your executive session before the board meeting if it's practical to do that. So it eliminates that issue. Well, except you would also have had to open a full open meeting before you adjourn to executive session. Because in order to do the executive session, you're required to have a motion in the open meeting explaining what the executive session is for. So you, you don't really solve the problem of the uncertainty of how long the executive session will take. So we've only got a couple minutes. I will just touch briefly on Risk v. Angel. This is a case in Washington that set the national standard for a board's duty of care. And the short version, because I only have three minutes, is it requires that board members make adequate inquiry, a reasonable inquiry, into an issue that they're making a decision on, and that they use objective information in making their decision. The case is one that went to the uh, Washington State Supreme Court twice. It was over plans to build a home by one owner. The next door neighbor was the board president. The board president opposed it. None of the other board members ever visited the site to look at it. They didn't look at the plans. And the court held that the, uh, the board did not act with reasonable care in following the advice and the uh, the photographs which had been mocked up inappropriately by the board member in making their decision. And uh, it, uh, it set the standard, which has been clarified a little bit by some other Washington case law, on the board member's duty to inquire, meaning you have to do investigation and have objective information, which may mean that you get outside information from managers, attorneys, engineers, landscapers, et cetera, in making your decision. It basically says the duty of ordinary and reasonable care or the, the duty of a prudent person in a similar situation requires inquiry into the facts and circumstances and use of objective information. So with that, I think we're going to hit 11 o'clock in less than half a minute. Gil? Yeah, thank you. Um, there was one question. Oh, they want, someone's asking what the name of the, the um, two parties were in that case that you just mentioned, Ken. RISS, R-I-S-S, V -S -S, Angel. Angel was the name of the board member. Okay. I just put it in the chat. Super. Uh, the question that we had was, and this goes back to board meetings, and this may be too so, specific. Um, Ken, I mean, Gil, is it the is it the longer one that that Jenny no. posted, or something different? No, okay, good. I just me, wanted to make sure. No, sent to me privately. Thank you. Uh, are all ACC requests supposed to be presented in board meetings? It's really going to depend on how your uh, governing documents are written. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the ACC is the body which makes the decision, so it would never come to the board. 
Uh, sometimes it can come to the board as an appeal on the ACC's decision. Sometimes the ACC makes recommendations and the board is always the final decision maker. So I, I, there's just no way to answer that without reviewing the specific documents for your community. Okay, super. And with that uh, final comment from Ken, it is 11 o'clock, folks. So thank you again for uh, participating in this week's Zoom. Enjoy the long Memorial Day weekend coming up. We'll see you next Wednesday. Send, send your questions by Tuesday. Thank you.